Thank you, Ben Habib, for joining me today. I'd love to know more about your journey, how you came to do permaculture. Yeah, thanks for having me on, April. My permaculture journey started in 2014. I did the PDC at Ceres in Melbourne. Uh, I had a sabbatical semester at work, uh, so I had a bit of space to do something. Uh, and I'd known about permaculture for over a decade and thought, okay, I'm going to try this out. This is something I want to do. And it changed my life. And I got invited to become a teacher into the PDC uh, in the, the one after the, the PDC that I did. And I've been teaching at Ceres ever since. But as a, someone who's a, into environmental politics in my lecturer position at La Trobe University, I'm looking for a, a sustainability methodology that works, that, that I can give to students when they say, Ben, we know the world's in trouble. What, what can we do? Uh, and what's something that's, you know, gives more agency than just changing light bulbs? Uh, something that gives you a systems approach. So that's what permaculture is. Applied permaculture ethics and principles and that kind of sort of systems design thinking to social and economic systems, to building community and, and managing relationships at different scales from you know, within yourself right up to the global level, which is, you know, as an international relations specialist, that's where I play professionally. Because of my position, it gives me a, an opportunity to be able to link people up who are in different spheres. Uh, and then in my own work, kind of combine some of the best insights and strategies from all of these different places and, and try and work it together. So it's an interesting place to be, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a conventional permaculture practitioner. Well, I'm not sure what conventional is anymore. <laughs> it's true. Um, what I love about it is that it can be not just tailored, but it can actually um, grow into lots of different forms with each person and each site. Do you feel that we're now in a position that we can start to say, I'm going to consult for this. I'm going to do a design to enhance the social aspects of this community. That's a great question. So I guess the answer is simple, yes and no. Right. And the starting point for me is what's the site when we're doing socioeconomic work? What's the site that we're doing? It's not a discrete block of land that is stuck in one place, right? It's, it can be at any different level of scale from yourself, you know, your household, up to organisations, governments, that could be your site. But it's a much more dynamic space because you're plugged in, you know, as a human being, you're plugged into all of these different ecological networks, social networks, economic networks, political networks. And it's the story gets more complicated. And because if you personally are the site, you're moving as well. So you can find yourself in different environments. Mm. So traditional site analysis, we can't transfer that literally, but we can use those same principles as an analog uh, in order to get insights. They're still useful, but it's not quite the same process, I don't think. So... Could you give me a process for um, beginners? Yeah, well, I think doing your self-work is the most important first step. It's all about the relationships that are formed between people or between people and place or between people and organisations. So social permaculture is all about how you facilitate those relationships, manage those relationships, make them fairer so that they can operationalise those core permaculture ethics that we have. So to do that well, you need to be able to step into that space with a high level of self-awareness and have done the work that on your shit. Because if you want to be a constructive member of community, you can't be externalising your past traumas or your issues or your lack of self-awareness into that shared space because it's going to become toxic. And you know, people do this unintentionally all the time. And I've also noticed in permaculture world as well, a lot of us arrive at permaculture looking for something different and something nourishing because we're coming from lives or spaces that have hurt us. Mm -hmm. So we're coming in with a bit of baggage and trauma. So we need to be able to process that trauma so that we don't bring that into the space in an unconstructive way. But then you can do your, your, your zones. So there's analogs for... Uh, social zones and Luby McNamara's work uh, from her book People and Permaculture. I love that. I think that's fantastic. So that's a good reference. Uh, you can do sector analysis. Uh, and again, it's not a traditional sector analysis, but you're still looking for influences and forces that are affecting you as the site from outside of your 
network. So systems of power, you know, big global forces or big national forces, they're things that you know, have an influence. And so you can account for them in your design. Uh, you can still do needs and functions analyses, uh, but it's not strictly about yield in the traditional sense. You know, your, your interpretation of what yield is, is a bit broader and expanded. So using a lot of analogs uh, in order to get insights about how to do this work. That's brilliant. Thank you. We know that permaculture thinking is about developing stuff that's locally specific based on your unique circumstances and where you are and, you know, the, the unique challenges that you've got. And that, I think that applies to people's well-being as well when they're coming into the space. I know when I came into permaculture, this is this community that's actually really caring uh, and is so different. You know, I think about my, my workplace, academia is really stressful and often really toxic. And then when I come and do work in permaculture, it's a really different environment. So I love coming and teaching into permaculture because it's a different audience and it's a different environment that's way more life affirming. And so if we can keep nurturing that collaborative loving space that we've got in permaculture, that's a great contribution because that lets people heal. Um, what other models do you find are really nurturing of that sort of friendly and kind space? This is where the design thinking comes in in a more structured way. In any organised gathering, is it a hierarchy? And that's the stuff we're used to. Or is it something that's flatter and horizontal? Permaculture, social organisation, at its best, makes a really good use of horizontal networking and creating a space for everyone to be involved. So for, if we look at the Permaculture Collab project, so that was this international project of people from around the world who wanted to coordinate at an international level in a more focused way. But because permaculture has traditionally been very spread out and anarchic, you know, it's really hard to collaborate at a, at a larger level without sacrificing what's good about horizontal organisation. And so they arrived at this constellation model where rather than having setting up a, a traditional organisation to oversee collaboration, it's okay, we'll provide the platform where people can come together in constellations, which is different issue and interest areas. And the technological platform of the CoLab online collaborative tools would provide the space where people could meet and do that collaborative work at scale from different places around the world. So online technology can be useful because it gives us a platform for peer-to-peer -peer collaboration without having to meet up. But being able to meet up is still a really good thing. I want to thank you for talking with me today. Um, thank you, April. Really appreciate the invitation to come on. You're welcome.